Hal Gregerson, Stuart Black, thank you for being with us today. There are many books uh, about organizational change on the market today. How is yours different? I guess there are a couple of things. So first of all, most change books have it backwards. They talk about uh, organizational change and really focus on the organization, changing its structure, reward systems, that sort of thing. And in fact, if you want to change the organization, you've got to start with individuals. Because it change, uh, because an organization changes only as fast or as far as the individuals. To the layman, that might seem like a, an obvious conclusion. Has that not been the case over the years? Well, it's interesting. When we work with managers, here's the default mindset, which is they think about change. It's easy for them to start thinking systems and context and structure and all these things that aren't personal. But when you push them to where they have to think of individuals and people that they know changing, it becomes a very different conversation. And even though it may sound obvious, many managers don't have that it starts with one link to how they approach change. To them, it starts with the system and the structure and the context. And as a result, they skip the focus on the individual. So if there was one big idea that you would want someone reading this book to walk away with, what would it be? It starts with one. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. That uh, change really starts focusing on who are the individuals you're trying to change, why you're trying to change them, how are you going to change them, and how do they look at the change. If you can't zero in on those individuals, you can pull all the organizational levers you want, and uh, there is no guarantee at all that things will change, which is why the overall change figure for success is so low. Only about 30% of organizational change uh, initiatives succeed. 70% fail which is an important statistic because if it were the reverse, right, if only 30% of the initiatives failed, you could blame it on all the dumb managers out there, right? I mean, there must be at least 30% of the managers who are dumb. Well, when 70% of the initiatives fail, it must mean there are a lot of smart, motivated, capable managers who are nonetheless failing at change. So there's got to be a systematic reason behind it. And part of it is, as Hal said, they're focused at the organizational level. They're changing the structure. Uh, people are smart. You change the structure, they can figure out a way to behave the way that they were before, even in spite of a you know, new reporting line, a new box with a new title on it. Okay? And that's what uh, you know, too many managers forget, is how smart people are. Uh, and they're not that easily manipulated by these large, you know, uh, sort of levers like structure or rewards. You talk about three inconvenient truths in the book. Take us through those and, and how you arrived at those. I mean, the three key inconvenient truths, I mean, one is around being able to see the need for change. The other is around moving once I see the need for change. And the final piece is um, once I'm moving, actually being able to finish the need for change. And so part of it is, you know, it's how do you get people to literally change their maps upstairs? And those three inconvenient truths are really focused on changing those maps. Let's talk about the, the mental maps and, and how to change them. Um, through the course of this book, you give various examples. One is the butcher and how the butcher <laughs> didn't want to accept the outside input, let's say. Right. Take us through a, an example, either that one or one like it, uh, in which people are resistant to change and then how you get them to change that mental map. Well, I mean, basically, years ago, Stuart and I were working with organizations trying to get more employee engagement and it happened that one of these organizations was in a meatpacking factory. They'd spent three days of intensive training trying to get non-managerial people to take on management roles and tasks, you know, to be more responsible for scheduling, for motivation, for selecting people, for rewarding and so on, things managers typically do, typically do but getting the employees to do it. At the end of all this training, this big 300-pound butcher stands up, slams his cleaver into the table, basically, and says, wait a minute, I demand my right to have a manager tell me what to do and when to do it. And no matter what we could have done, we never could have changed that person's map. I mean, he was set, dead set on, there was no way he was going to take responsibility for what he did beyond exactly what the manager told him to do. How often do you run into that problem of, you, you believe you have a good process for bringing organizations to a different place, but there's resistance, perhaps not from the managers from whom you might expect it, but from the employees who are used to a structure uh, that does not allow for what you're necessarily talking about. Uh, 
it all the time. So, I mean, essentially there are three barriers, and the first one is the failure to see the need, and at least 30% of the change initiatives get taken out by that first barrier. That is, people are used to doing things a certain way, but the important thing to appreciate there, it's not just that they're used to it, they choose that way because it's been successful. In other words, people have different mental maps of uh, how to receive supervision or provide supervision, how to run a business, how to provide feedback or anything. So they have different maps for that, but they have those maps for one and only one reason, the world over, because that map has worked for them. And the longer that map has worked, in one sense, the more sense it makes to hang on to it. Okay? So they have these mental maps. Many of them have been ingrained for years and years and years with lots of success behind it. And as a consequence, unless you provide a big enough contrast and an engaging enough experience, you can't break through it. So I'll, I'll give you a simple one with Toyota. Uh, very successful car company, arguably the most successful that we have on the planet today. Okay? group of their executives in North America, which consisted of some Japanese expatriates plus North American executives, said, ah, the market we need to get into is the full-size truck and SUV market. It's fastest growing and the most profitable in terms of per vehicle profits. Sent a note over to headquarters, Tokyo, they said, no, that's not our segment. We sell to middle-class families, and the people who buy full-size trucks are cowboys and ranchers and construction workers. Those are our customers, so no. Long story short, they send over PowerPoint presentations, Excel files, et cetera, et cetera, all with data, and headquarters says no. Well, the North American executives didn't give up. They knew that in the largest car market in the world, they had to get into the fastest growing and the most profitable segment. So what did they do? Well, they need to create some contrast to break through this mental map. So they took the senior executives to a football game. You know, what does football have to do with any of this? Well, if you know North American football, uh, collegiate or professional, actually they took them to a Dallas Cowboys football game, two hours before the game, there's a party, and that party is called a tailgate party. Why? Because the back end of a pickup has a tail, right? It's a gate. It's called a tailgate. So they go to the party, and what do they see? Ranchers, cowboys, etc.? No. They see middle-class families there with their pickups and SUVs having a tailgate party. So they were able to see the contrast, uh, not just see it, they could hear it, they could taste it, they could smell it, they could touch it, and as a consequence of this contrast, that's really what changed them. So you have to create a powerful enough contrast between what people have thought and what needs to be, and you got to engage with them in an experiential way enough to break through that first barrier. Because if you don't, time and time again, the change initiative will essentially fail just on this first barrier. And in the end, this experience, seriously, the football game and the experience that the global executives had led them to finally approve the Tundra, which on a per vehicle basis is Toyota's most profitable vehicle. They just completed a plant in the U.S. that now will produce 250,000 Tundras a year. So it's a real issue your three barriers that you've identified, failure to see, failure to move, failure to finish. Let's go through each one of those and just briefly give what you see are some of the uh, things that will help get past those, those barriers. So failure to see, how does somebody get over, uh, get over that barrier? I mean, in terms of failure to see, uh, the easiest way to think about it is the same way we physically see. Okay? To physically see something, you need contrast. Contrast in light, shape, color, etc. If you don't have contrast, you can't see anything. The second thing is we see things best that are directly in front of us. So things that are off in our peripheral vision, we don't see so clearly. So if I go back to the Toyota example, that's exactly what they did. So the contrast between what they thought were their core customers 
and what they thought were the customers of full-size trucks and the reality of what really were the customers. And the customers for full-size trucks were families, just like the customers for Toyota Camrys. But then you've got to confront the people with that contrast. That is, you've got to experientially engage them. And literally, the more senses that you can engage, the more successful you'll be in having people accept that difference. So that's the first thing. It's two dimensions, contrast and confrontation. Creating the difference and in an engaging, almost experiential way. If you don't do those two things, you won't be successful in breaking through the first barrier and helping people see the need. Uh, Hal, take us through the failure to move. I think a fun example for that fairly recently was Heathrow Terminal 5. <laughs> Not I mean, fun for a lot of people. Uh, not fun that, for that a lot there. of people. It was obvious to the baggage handlers. They saw the need. It was clear to them that when the bags come off that belt, they've got to get them in the right place so the planes will go off and the people will have their bags. The problem was the managers didn't take the time to think through individual baggage handlers' capabilities to make the move. In other words, to actually take that bag, get it where it's supposed to be in the timely way it's supposed to be there. And so the big challenge on the seeing and the moving part is getting people capable to do something new they've never done before. And if it's new and it's never been done before, by definition, I'm not good at it. And managers often, once they see the light, get you to change or me to change, they simply assume that now you see the light, you can automatically go and do something new perfectly, which is simply not the case. They thought baggage handlers could get at the end of that belt without much training, without much development of their ability, without even giving them a map of where they're supposed to take the bags to and expect them to perform their job well. Well, they performed it horribly, not because they were incapable, but because management didn't help them know how to become capable. Is this part of what you talk in the book uh, about uh, some managers who, who give the old do as I say, not as I do uh, sort of reference point to employees? It's an interesting way of putting it because the managers who are really good at starting with individuals, starting with one in terms of making change happen, they're consistently, week after week, month after month, paying attention to the active development of their subordinates, their direct reports, abilities. And when managers aren't doing that, they're really unlikely to see how I can help you get better at what you're doing and give you the resources to do it, give you the technology, give you the training, give you the support, all those things. And so it is tightly linked. If, if I don't pay enough attention to where you're really at to know you're not able to do what I've asked you to do, you know, you're not going to make the move. You're going to be stuck. It, well, it's partly because people are really smart. Okay? They're not dumb. Mm. So they know the new thing. They know they won't be instantly good at it. And a lot of people would rather be good at the wrong thing than bad mm. at the right thing. Mm. And they can think this through. Um, so my first real experience was uh, with IBM when they went through this major transition from selling boxes, that is mainframe servers, et cetera, to selling solutions. One of the key things that was required in selling solutions is teamwork, right? Because I now have to pull different uh, products together, software together, plus account uh, management folks, et cetera. And before that, I never had to do that. So you look at it and you say, well, you're running a team. Well, it's a very, very diverse team, which requires a different set of skills. So in fact, lots of people said, I understand the new strategy. I understand the new structure, I understand the rationale for it. And I ask them, are you changing? No, no, I'm not changing. Why? Because I'm no good at this new stuff and I've not been given the skills, so I'd rather be competent at the wrong thing than incompetent at the right thing. And until someone gave them those skills, they weren't moving, even though IBM had broken through the first barrier. And people did see the need to change, but they still weren't moving because as Hal pointed out, they hadn't been given the skills, and until they got that, they weren't confident that they could succeed. Let's segue that into your final point, which is failure to finish. How do you overcome that? What's a tool or tools to overcome that? I mean, the key thing there is, if, I, if we do what we've described, which is, okay, I see what you want me to do. 
I'm willing to try. I'm willing to persist at it, but at some point, I'm not getting, I'm not getting great at it quickly. It's going to take time to develop the skills to be really expert, to be masterful at what I'm doing. I mean, it may be a simple thing like customer service, where maybe I'm an airline company and I've got to have more of a customer service orientation, better you know, response to customers' needs. I may get that. I may be trying new things in order to do it well, but at the end of the day, I've got a lot of people screaming at me. You know, they're mad, they're angry, and at some point, if I'm human, I'm ready to say, Forget that. I'm not trying this new customer service stuff anymore. It's just exhausting. And so at that point, you know, one of the suggestions is not necessarily having a champion at the top of the organization, but I've got to have somebody really close to me who can tell me when I'm just tired and ready to give up that it's worth it. Keep going. Here's what's going well. Here's what's not so going so well. Keep at it. I'm behind you. You know, having that kind of support helps me when I get tired to keep going in spite of it being so exhausting. And most organizations make a fundamental mistake here. When they talk about champions, they invariably talk about and think about champions at the top of the house, right? If you're going to have a successful change, you must have a senior executive be the champion, okay? So then most organizations don't make strategic changes without champions at the top of the house, yet lots of them fail. Why? Because champions at the top of the house do not, do not make the change. Customer service, if you take the airline example, it's not the CEO who provides better customer service. It's the gate agent, it's the ticket agent, it's the flight attendant. And at the time they're going through the frustration of getting through that first third of the learning curve, and they're trying hard, but they're not mastered it yet, and therefore they're not getting good results yet, they could care less that there are senior executives who are championing this. What they need is a champion right there where they're getting or not getting traction. And that's where most organizations mess up is they think about champions at the top of the house. They don't think about champions down where real change and real work gets done and essentially where the rubber meets the road and this great strategic initiative actually gains traction customer service for an airline doesn't gain traction in the CEO suite. It gains traction at the gate, at the ticket counter, and that's where the champion is needed. Um, and you can think about anything. Learn a new language. Learn the violin. That first third of the learning curve is where you're putting tons of energy in and you have almost nothing to show for it. And if you don't have someone continuing to encourage you, you don't get past that first third. And if you don't get past that, the whole initiative slides back, which is why this third barrier is so critical, because you can break through barrier one, barrier two, people see the need, they make the move, then they fail to finish. And if they fail to finish, the ultimate result is the change initiative has failed. I mean, there's one last piece to that failure to finish piece, um, which is... Uh World over, I don't care what the culture is, any family on a journey, be it in a car or a train or a plane, and it's a long journey, what do children always ask? Are we there yet? <laughs> and they're trying to figure out, you know, am I good enough? Have I accomplished what we were supposed to do? Have we made it? Have we succeeded? And again, I may have, as a manager, helped you see the need to change. I may have given you the capabilities to start building this capacity to do this new thing well. But if I don't fundamentally care about your success in that new endeavor, at some point, I'll stop watching. And I'll stop telling you whether we're, you're there or not. And, and it kind of drifts. And you get lost. And it's like, does she really care about me doing this? Does the organization really care about me changing? And so part of it is, as a manager, my job is to help you know where are we at? We're getting there. We're almost there. Here's why. Here's how. Here's some feedback. Here's what's going well. Here's what's not going well to make that happen. You mentioned Toyota um, mm -hmm. uh, earlier, Stuart. What are some other companies that you recognize globally who are, who are seeing, moving, and finishing uh, in, a, in a good way regularly? I, I mean, one that I track and Hal does as well is Nokia. Uh, because they made an amazing anticipatory change in 1992. In 1992, the number one 
uh, mobile phone, cell phone, hand phone, whatever you want to call it, company in the world was Motorola. Nearly a 40% global share. Uh, Nokia's share, zero. Effectively zero when they decided to move into this. So they created the need, they created the capabilities, they fought continuously through it, and we know what happened. Uh, which is now they're number one. They peaked at 40%. They've come off a little bit because a new upstart called Samsung came from nowhere, right? In 1992, Samsung wasn't in the business. In 1997, Samsung wasn't in the business. Wasn't until about 2002, okay? So even then, though, Nokia responded. They dipped down, and now they've recovered again. Um, and, uh, you know, sad news for Motorola, and they're about to sell off, right, their mobile communication business because they haven't been able to effectively regain their former glory in this business. So there's a side-by-side -side example of one company who was very good at seeing the need, making the move, fighting through the finish, then getting attacked again and making some changes, being successful, fighting through, and another company, Motorola, who was great, fell from grace, tried to recover, and just hasn't been able to manage it to the point now where they're going to try and sell off that piece of the business. Um, I mean, one of the companies we're working with is Lilly Pharmaceutical, um, particularly in Europe, where in the European context, the world has turned upside down for, for, for pharmaceutical companies. Um, where I may have been a sales rep trying to sell uh, drugs to doctors before, and I could go to the doctor and have a conversation. Well, the laws have changed. It's illegal for them now to have the conversation. That world turning upside down has demanded that inside the organization, they've got to figure out new ways of doing things and get people along that path to make it happen. So part of getting the seeing the need for change there is getting people out right in the midst of the customers. So people in human resources, for example, who haven't seen heart operations are going to the hospitals and watching this process to understand what is this world that these doctors are really working in? And then they step back from that and they're trying to figure out what could I be doing differently in my everyday work that would make Lilly better respond to those customer needs. And so it's, it's a tight connection between their, their working world and, and the customer's experience. It's the more they do that, the more likely they are to make this seeing move, which is, ah, we do need to have this different and it gives them a compelling reason to step back and actually make the move by building new capabilities, which takes, you know, it takes senior management support, it takes training and support, and at the end of the day, it takes individual managers paying individual attention to real people who are individuals who've got a world they're in and they're trying to move to an entirely new one. But again, it's experience. In other words, helping people see the need by PowerPoint unlikely work. to be very effective, no. okay? Versus getting people out there and experiencing, see what it's like for the doctor and the patient. Because ultimately, for a drug company, pharmaceutical company, it's the patient, right, that is the ultimate, if you will, user of their product. And you don't understand that contrast unless you have some experience with it. And Lily has recognized this and moving forward, and uh, it'll be an interesting you know, race to see. This mm -hmm. is unfolding mm -hmm. over the next decade in terms of how well various pharmaceutical companies respond to this you know, significant regulatory change. Yeah. Quick closing question to each of you. What will or should be the legacy of this book? For me, what, what I get satisfaction is when I have a senior executive uh, you know, talk to me and talk about uh, both the change that it made for them because this is one of the changes in the book, by the way, in terms of the second edition, is a much deeper discussion about how individual leaders can change themselves. Because rarely is there a need in the organization for a change and not for the leader of that organization. So I get great satisfaction when a leader calls up and says, this book was great and it really helped me think about and make the changes in myself that I needed in order to lead the changes in the organization. So that's one thing that I get a lot of satisfaction from and I guess in, the, in your terms would be a legacy that I'd like to see even enhanced with this second edition. You know, my response is 
change happening, I'll go back to the starts with one. I mean, I'm in the similar place where Stuart is, which is it is incredibly rewarding for managers to realize their behavior alone makes a huge impact on change happening. The second piece to that is when they have enough introspection to see the need, make the move, start to get things finished on their own behaviors at work, then they're more likely to realize how hard it is to change and they'll pay attention to their people and where they're really at and they will then help them as individuals go through a similar process. And you put those two things together, them starting with themselves as the one and then moving to the individual, when that happens in an authentic, honest way, it creates this power for change that doesn't happen with a 15-step change model. It's a very simplistic one at one level, but when it's personalized, it has a real impact. And I guess for me, that's the bottom line. In other words, you want it to be powerful and practical. Uh, and so there has to be real components to it, but it's got to be simple enough that people can put it into practice. Because at the end of the day, you don't get change unless you can put it into practice. So if the legacy is it was powerful and practical, then I'm pretty happy. Stuart Black, Hal Gregerson, co-authors of It Starts With One. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank Thanks. you.